This is a University of Otago podcast. The research that I'm doing is looking at how you can improve your library service by having a librarian inside your online classroom. So it's, this is something that you can't easily do in a contact class. Um, and one of the things I'd like to say about distance education, it's not a poor cousin to classroom teaching at all. It's, it's a parallel avenue, but it has the potential to go into places and to do things that you can't do in a classroom. So quickly what we have here on the left, the circle is the classroom, the outside edges are the wider institution. Got faculty and students in the classroom and the libraries on the outside. So the arrows there are about the lines of communication between the, the, the players. On the right we have the same thing but this is the online classroom and if you strategically place one embedded librarian, so you put your librarian and put them into the classroom, it's only one more player, but you can see there are a lot more lines of communication and a lot more opportunities there. Now that's a really good example of Metcalfe's law. If you've come across how many he deals in network theory. And his law says that as you introduce the number of players, then the number of connections available in the network expands exponentially. So it's only one more person, but it's double the points of contact. Now, my research question, for my thesis, was to look at the second half and to say, OK, how does this actually work in practice, and how can we maximise the value of it? And the first thing I realised was that there is no model. So I set about trying to make one. These are the methods I tried. Conceptual model is great, but it doesn't show you how thing works in practice. Same for a theoretical model. Observational is fine, but it only describes the classrooms I looked at and not all of the other classroom styles that are out there. There's no standard form of providing the service yet, it's too new. And transactional doesn't show you how it works, it shows you how it can work at its optimum. So none of these were, were actually going to be useful in finding out how a thing works in practice and how you can make it better in practice. Um, I should probably say the, the embedded librarian, it's a very specific term. That was coined in 2004 by Barbara Dewey. So the whole practice of embedding a librarian into an area um, is quite new. So what has happened is, with a lot of things in distance education, the practice is developing as people try things and find things that work or don't work, but the theory is lagging quite a bit behind. So I tried all of these. And I thought, OK, how do you draw a model of an emerging practice in a dynamic environment? Mm. So I came across this wee beauty, perpetual beta model. Um, and this is a model that just says you can't draw it. It's in production, it's in development, it's in testing, it's continually being refined and changed and updated. And by the time you draw it and it hits the paper, it's already out of date. So I thought, OK, that's it. It's perpetual beta. End of story. Um, but I still have to go and draw the model. So um, in trying to do this, it was actually a fair bit of thinking time. And in, in the end, like with a lot of things, you think, I can't get an answer because I'm actually asking the wrong question. I had case studies and I knew of two different styles of providing an embedded librarian. How on earth do you draw a model that covers those and all of the other options that are out there when you don't even know what the other options are? I spent ages saying, OK, can't draw it, can't draw it. Then I thought, OK, why can't I draw it? And in the end I said, because they're just at different stages. 
And that was that, the different stages of what? So what we've actually got isn't a fixed model or drawing, it's a continuum of things. So I'm developing the Sammer Ilms model, which I'll explain in a sec. Four different stages, we've got the classroom on the left, the library on the right. The blue circle is the library service that's being provided. So that's those four things, the documentary supply, the um, information literacy, knowledge creation and lifelong learning. And you can see that the service actually moves slowly from the library and ends up all the way into the classroom. So we're going to go through these four stages and I think what you might find interesting actually is hearing, we've got New Zealand examples of all four stages so you'll be able to catch up to see what's happening around the rest of the country. First one is substitution. This is where um, you first go online and what you're doing is you're trying to emulate the distance, uh, emulate the classroom model. So you have your online classroom just like you would have your face-to-face uh, -face classroom and the students if they want library service they have to go out of there and into the library and it's and totally up to the student to go and do that. So the, the library support is responsive, it's done entirely in the library, there is no change to the regular model. So the example of that is Otago, um, it may have changed a little but when I started on the EdD program, in our first residential course we came and um, did five days here, did a second five days in the second year and we were sent off to the library for a um, better part of a day to do all of our tutorials, to learn how to use EndNote, to learn how to use the databases, everything. So we got it all in one hit. It's called One Shot Instruction. And um, it works, but anything you want later on, the student has to go and get. And there's a big time lag sometimes. So by the time you say, I have to write that literature review now, but I can't remember how to use those databases anymore, or, oh yeah, someone mentioned something about a referencing software but you know, it was easy just not to use one. Um, so there are problems with this model. Augmentation is when you take what's existing and you augment it just a little bit. So in this case, still provided mainly in the library but there is some reach into the classroom. And there's a really good example of this at Massey University. And now the way they do this, they have a librarian in their online classroom and if there are any questions, she will, um, she or he, um, will make an appointment with, with that student to meet them in the library and they book out a half hour or hour session. So they have their one-on-one -on -one interaction. Um, but it's, it's easy for the students to make contact because there's a known person, they don't have to go into a big place and find someone. They've got someone that's dedicated to their class and understands the particular subject area that they're doing and the, the level of work that they're at. So that's quite useful. Um, at Massey they also use a range of online tutorials. So they'll have individual packages, um, a tutorial for how to use this database for how to write a, li uh, a literature review for whatever else it is. Um, and they call those reusable learning objects. They'll develop them for one class and then they can pull that out and use that same package in another online class if that's what that class needs. So it's a very economical way of providing quite tailored support to each class. Um, there are a number of students, quite a number of students, who go into their class and they'll bookmark their online class. Then they just go straight there, they don't go in through the front end of the university website, they don't go past the library, they don't collect notices, they don't see what's happening around the rest of the place. So a lot of them will miss the library, but because part of it is inside the classroom, it's right there and it's a good reminder and it's easily accessible. Modification. Um, 
in this, the, the way the learning happens starts to change. Um, this is it's quite an exciting stage, this one. I'm working with this at the Open Polytechnic. Um, we've probably got the advantage that all that we do is distance education, so we don't have some of the same constraints about having to manage against a, a contact situation. So the way that we set up, um, we have an embedded librarian for each course at the bachelor's degree level. And they have their own presence inside the classroom, they've got their own discussion forum. So they come in right at the start and introduce themselves and say what things they can do for the class. Um, and then they run a discussion forum. So any questions that students want to ask about um, search terms, about databases, about finding information, about where did my ebook disappear to on my screen, um, how to reference this, how to use APA style, whatever it is, um, gets asked and answered as part of that classroom. So it actually builds up a store of information. And what you end up having is a, instead of a one-to-one -one learning situation that you usually get with the student and the librarian, you suddenly have a one-to-many learning situation with a record that runs for the entire duration of that class. Um, we've tracked the number of times the library form is accessed in the classroom and we find that a lot of students are actually, um, not many are asking questions because if they have, if another student has the question they can just go in and look and see that one's already been answered and I've got the answer. So it cuts down the work on the library staff, everyone gets the information. Um, it provides a lot of parity across the classroom as well because all of the students are getting the information they'd be getting more than they usually do because instead of saying, oh, I was also going to ask that question, uh, sometimes they say, well, I never even thought to ask that, or that resource sounds really good, I'll go and get that one too. So it actually improves. The, the way the service is being provided has modified the way that the learning happens. Redefinition is when the library service and all its component parts gets put entirely online. Um, in this particular one, no physical person inside the classroom. A lot of this is done at the course design level. So um, where the course is being designed, structured, written, built, all of the library stuff is being put in at that level. So it's quite integral to it. It's almost like it's being put in at the molecular level, really. It's, it can't be taken out again easily. Um, an example of this is at the ARA Institute of Canterbury. So they've, they've merged recently. Um, CPIT and Araki Polytechnic, at the beginning of this year, merged. And their library immediately went um, under a, quite a heavy restructure. So in that restructure, a third of their staff stayed in the library and did that um, documentary supply for information needs. Can't remember where the second third went. Um, and the, the other third, um, they went straight down to course design. So they became course designers because they had a library background and they were busy putting all of their skills. So there's other three things. The information literacy was becoming embedded in the course. Um, the knowledge creation is not so easy to embed because you've really got to work with people one-on-one -on -one for that. In the lifelong learning, it's very hard to instill a sense of um, wondering and wanting to go out and find more if you're actually providing everything at the course level. So it's another way of doing things. Um, so each of the stages has got real advantages with it, and each has got a bit of a caution with it as well. Um, and along that spectrum, I don't know that there's any point that is an optimum point. Um, they're all just at different stages and different ways of doing things, and it depends a lot on what your course content is like and how the rest of your institution works. 
Right, so that's the model overall that I'm looking at. Um, now, for the theologians, um, this is my take-home line for the day, and it comes from, uh, influenced by both Kent and Wesley, um, which says, a theory is all well and good, but a theory with no practical use is practically useless. Okay, so there's two ways that this model here has a real practical use. Um, it's called SAMA. This is taken from the SAMA model, which is looking at the integration of technology into the classroom. Um, what had happened was I, I drew my model and then I went looking to see if anyone had drawn something similar and found SAMA model. And I thought, it's actually quite so similar that I'd better just make an adaptation of it. That the ILS is for the integration of library services. So with SAMA, um, part of the purpose of SAMA is to provide a framework for people to understand where they are at with introducing technology and to know where to go to for the next step if they want to introduce it further and to use it. So the SAMA ILS model can be used the same way. It can be used as a a pathway if the library wants to provide a different type of service, a different level, or to identify where the next step is, then this will help it. So as a framework for identifying where people are at and where they can go, that's a use. And this is the other one. If you link it with any other measure that you want to, there's a possibility to use this as quite a good planning tool. So along the bottom, if you can measure where your degree of embeddedness is, so starting with your um, substitution at this end right through to your redefinition at the other, you can plot where you are and have your other measure. So whether that is um, the degree of um, information literacy your graduates have when they come out, um, whether it's how much money's being spent, on the library service. So pick a measure that's of interest to you. If you want to see how much library service should, be, should you be providing to get the most number of students um, with a good degree of information literacy by the time they go, um, then you should be able to plot where on this chart you are. Now, there needs to be a bit of big data gathered first. Um, if there were a large number of libraries, large number of institutions that were interested, we could plot to see where they all are and see what kind of scatter there is. And that would tell us if there is an optimum place for the best return of value and the best output for the students. So in this one, and ideally, ideally, you would have a line that goes straight up the middle that says the more you pump into your library services, the more information literate your students will be. I don't know if that's actually going to happen in practice, and I suspect it may not. Um, if you find that the line goes straight across the middle, then it means that whatever service you're providing, you're going to get the same output in your students, so it may not matter so much what you provide. Um, what I suspect you're going to end up with is a rising curve. Well, it will start part way up the graph because there are some students that have a clue. Um, rising graph up to a peak, and I suspect it will tip down again at the other end. The human interaction, which leads to the engagement that you get in those middle two sections, really shouldn't be overlooked. By the time you lose the human interaction at the end, you're going to start losing some of that value again. It's all about connection and about engagement. That's probably all I wanted to say for you today. So I shall say thank you and see if there's any questions. Um, I'm just wondering, you said you... Um, 
closer. Okay. Um, you surveyed Otago in 2011, and have you have you looked at how we've have you looked at anything since then? I'm just a wee bit upset because we have worked at, since 2009, and and now I think we would call ourselves a fully embedded in most in most courses undergraduate courses. Now postgraduates because we deliver a, a more and this is probably where we fall we falter a little bit in distance I guess as we do uh, emphasize personal face-to-face -face type support on campus for postgraduate students and so we do have um, subject librarians who are embedded fully amongst particularly undergrad courses and the professional courses as well so we have huge online integrated um, courses up to 20% of a whole course will be a library component, so that we're getting that kind of um, input. But I think you know, perhaps in distance and in certain in certain papers too, we don't have that um, that input, and perhaps that's it's not entirely the library's fault. Sometimes it's the way the paper prefers to to run. So I'd just like to say that you know, it'd be nice if you could look around the Otago model because I think we've done we've come a long way uh, since. Well, probably about 2010 when we when we um, realigned our all our services, and um, so yeah, we do have a, a big embed. You know, there's a lot going on here. Yeah, so just reassuring all the staff behind the academic staff behind us as well. That you know we've got, and I'm sure a lot of you guys know the the librarians that are very much um, part of your departments. And um, yeah, okay, thank you. That's all right. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to hear that. Um, now, the reason that I, I chose the examples I've got is because I started my study um, in 2012, and that's the point that I looked around to see what there was. So the case study examples that I've got were all what was happening in 2012. I'm aware that the environment's changing really quickly and people are keeping up to date. Um, and a lot of it is, it is like that perpetual beta model. Um, by the time you say, you know, here's my line in the sand, um, everything's moved. So, no, I'm, that's, that's lovely to hear. And I, I will be coming back to see exactly where everyone's up to, but at the moment I'm just focusing on developing a model. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Any other comments? Questions? Oh, sorry. Thelma. Hi, Penny. Um, oh, sorry, Alison. My name's Thelma. I'm a subject librarian and I've been here for 22 years at Otago. And I've recently moved into the health sciences and I'm becoming aware that there is a slight difference in some of our disciplines as to how the needs of the students are being met and what the expectations of the academics are that they would like the subject librarian's input with. So I'm not necessarily talking about the one-to-one, -one, but more at course design level. And so when Judy talked about adding value through our online resources, a lot of that will be embedded in Blackboard or Moodle. And so I appreciate you as a researcher may not be able to see some of the brilliant work that potentially has happened behind the scenes and our wonderful graduates are enjoying. So thank you for the opportunity that you're going to make to come back and see us. We want to show you what we've been doing and getting good results from. Thank you. It's a, that's a reflection of the way this university operates as well. It, it, there isn't one, one way of operating and it varies so much across the, the board. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a thing called a VUCA environment, um, which we seem to be operating in. I don't know if any of you have come across VUCA before. Yep. Yes. Um, VUCA, V-U-C-A. It is vol uh, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And that's the environment that we're working in. And the development of all of these things, it's quite organic, really, because there is no set way to do things. Um, and, and it is great to hear, and I know that there is a lot of work going on in a lot of institutions, um, and it is great. And all credit to Otago, um, there is a lot of stuff happening, I am aware. What is important though, Alison, is your model, and that's the model that you've been working on to try to articulate that organic 
movement and the range of ways just to sort of to help talk about it and think about it and to imagine it. Um, yes, so, so I think that's, that's going to be a wonderful um, final, or it's probably not the final part of your, your thesis and your work, but a, a really interesting output and outcome. So thank you very much, Alison, for sharing that with us. Really appreciate it.